Now let's go to your to your right. segment because yours has a very low tech. Yeah, <laughs> right. Feature. Yeah, there is a low, low tech, tech component. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean to switch gears, uh, I'm gonna be talking about uh, the school reopening fight. And so, as a public school teacher, the fight over a safe school reopening during COVID nineteen has deeply touched my life, the lives of my fellow union members, and the lives of the students I teach. And this fight has dragged on, and despite all the lives lost from the virus and the fact that it's still not under control, teachers are still fighting for the right to do their jobs without putting themselves, their families, and their students at risk. And in this battle, politicians and school district leaders have used the classic divide and conquer strategy to pit public workers against the rest of the population. And in this situation, political elites have material to work with, and it makes sense why the public would be frustrated with their children not going into schools. Teachers get it and we feel the pain. Virtual school is just not the same and there is nothing that can replace quality in-person instruction. No sane teacher would try to deny that. And of course, this is also causing a crisis of childcare for many working people. But nothing about this pandemic is ideal and forcing schools to open before the pandemic is under control and when many districts don't have the proper resources in order to do so safely, is just making a bad situation much worse. And before Trump left office, Democrats claimed to be against the push for schools to reopen and use that issue to beat up on Republicans. But with Biden's election, all of a sudden there was a growing bipartisan consensus around pushing schools to go back in person. This is a life and death struggle for teachers. School districts have been sacrificing funding and resources for years. And now many teachers are saying they're not willing to sacrifice their lives for incoherent and unsafe reopening plans. I'm going to focus on how this fight is playing out in two districts, uh, Chicago and my own district of Philadelphia. But this is, of course, a national fight going on in every city and state across the country. So for the last decade, the Chicago Teachers Union has often been a uh, trailblazer and set the path for teachers unions across the country. Starting under the leadership of Karen Lewis, who sadly passed away recently, they went to battle and struck against former Mayor Rahm Emanuel and current Mayor Lori Lightfoot for more school funding and strong contracts. Now, they've taken that spirit to fight for safe reopening of schools. The plan in Chicago, which has been mimicked in many places, calls for a phased-in reopening that creates division between staff that have to go in first and those that do not. So let's listen to some response um, CTU officials had to the mayor's recent plan to reopen schools. The Chicago Teachers Union responded to the city's decision to push forward with the reopening in their own press conference. The level of care that come from the people who run this, this system. It really sucks. I'm trying not to be emotional. My six-year-old nephew was the first person in my family to contract COVID. I've had four other family members since him, with two of them right now in ICU. I mean, I appreciate doctors saying that Kids need to be in school. I, my own kids need to be in school. Um, I, I take the point. Um, I would say to the doctors, they don't necessarily know what conditions are like in CPS buildings. There's a, there's a long history where we're told things will happen that don't happen. One of the things music teacher Quentin Washington wants to see at his school is mandatory testing. We need to have like professional sports type of testing where we're being tested regularly. And CPS's current policy is it's voluntary for staff. But that's not adequate. Quentin is also worried that splitting classrooms in person and virtual will be even more detrimental than a fully remote system, especially for diverse learners. That's unfair to the people that are on remote learning. We heard from parents who had similar concerns and chose to keep their students at home and others who were looking forward to their kids return. So what C2 President Jesse Sharkey said strikes a chord with anyone who has taught in a school district like Chicago. Political elites and scientists do not understand the reality of what conditions are like in these schools and how these conditions make it virtually impossible to follow the reopening guidelines the science suggests. So in response to the push for reopening, teachers in Chicago took action to demonstrate that they do want to do their jobs, but only safely by teaching outside their schools. 
The CTU and some of its supporters getting ready for a news conference to talk about their day. But what you're looking at here behind me is a playground that turned into a classroom setting for some of the teachers today who set up outside here at Bertano Math and Science Academy, a statement of defiance against the CPS return to the classroom order that the teachers say is built based on health and safety concerns. It's chilly, but the parents are incredibly supportive. With temperatures hovering below freezing today, some teachers at Brentano Elementary bundled up and set up tables and computers outside so they could still teach virtually without going into their classrooms. I don't, I don't want to catch this disease. I don't want to bring this disease home to my family. I have elderly parents that live with me. Um, I don't want my students to catch this disease. As the teacher said, despite the propaganda, many parents are on the side of the teachers and understand that they are fighting for them as well and have a similar lack of trust in the district's ability to follow through on actual safe protocols. And as a result of their organizing, teachers in Chicago want a much more comprehensive, though still not perfect, reopening plan. Uh, Labor Notes reported on the reopening plan saying, the CTU agreement increases vaccine access for educators who are required to enter buildings, delays the return to buildings for some, and establishes union-dominated building safety committees. It also guarantees ADA accommodations for educators who are the primary caregivers to individuals especially vulnerable to COVID, and establishes metrics for what would prompt the district to close school buildings or go fully remote again. And in Philadelphia, my union, the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers, has become deeply embroiled in this same fight. In the summer and the fall, the Philadelphia School District tried to force students and teachers back and failed both times because of overwhelming public opposition. No one in Philly will soon forget the record six hour long school board meeting with over 150 community members in a row speaking against their plan. In January, the district started to make noise about reopening again. Surely this time they would come up with a foolproof plan, a solid plan, a plan no one could poke holes in or protest to. Surely they wouldn't embarrass themselves their third time trying to force us back. Let's look at what they came up with. Philadelphia School District is defending its use of window ventilation fans in school buildings as part of its COVID safety plan. The district released this video of the installation process. Pre-K through second grade students will begin to return to in-person learning February 22nd. Some parents and teachers complain the ventilation strategy is insufficient. The school district disagrees. This is an additional layer of safety. So on top of all the other measures that were taking place upon the recommendation of the CDC, the Philadelphia Department of Public Health, other uh, public health experts, you know, this is just one other way to ensure that the rooms um, are safe for our students and staff to return. Window fans are recommended as part of the CDC's mitigation guidelines. That's it, folks. A fan. You know, just blow that COVID air around a little and everything will be fine. That's how it works. And it's so much worse when you consider the fact that many of our schools have had serious ventilation issues for years, which have failed to be addressed. Also, Philly teachers have still not received the vaccine and we aren't slated to start until at least March. So let's listen to some of some members of my union and Philly public school parents talk about how they feel about this reopening plan. The fans are, are a really bad solution because as you can see, they're exposed to the outside, which means they will, they could be rained on but these are residential grade pieces of equipment, not commercial grade. And from the manufacturer, they, they're not supposed to be out in the rain. So they shouldn't even be run in rainy or snowy conditions. That's not concrete enough for me to feel comfortable to first myself enter a building, but on top of that, my son enter a building. He's asthmatic. When I go back to school, he's in fourth grade, so he'll still, still be virtual learning. But I am into buildings, and my mother, who is immunocompromised, will be watching him. Isaiah, how do you feel about going back to school? Well, not that good, because nobody should be um, getting sick, and I feel that every time somebody gets sick, there's going to be more cases. And I think every time somebody gets sick, it spreads. In a district like ours, it makes no sense for us to have aging air systems in our buildings. All these buildings should be modernized and up to code. It makes me feel like we're forgotten. There is no working functional uh, ventilation system. And that's a big concern for students and staff when we don't have a system to 
take care of ventilation. I had put my son back on the list to go, but being as though we have no ventilation reports and the school district is not being consistent and not getting back to me, I feel as if it's not safe at this time for the children nor the staff or teachers at this point. I'm very uncomfortable with sending my children back to school due to the conditions of the school in terms of, you know, with the with the current COVID conditions and the plan that the, the district has came up with. I mean, when you talk about sending our children back to school, you have to take into consideration the, the health and safety of our children, which, is our, which are our most prized possessions, as well as the health and safety of our, our staff at the schools who are there to educate our children. Kindergarten through second grade teachers were ordered to report last Monday, but our union refused to go in and we held pickets at schools across the district instead. If there was any good that came out of this, it created a sense of solidarity in my union that hasn't been there for a while. And on Monday, many teachers walked their first picket line or did their first union action. While the district was threatening the discipline teachers who didn't show up, our organizing forced the mayor of Philadelphia to intervene. And all last week and this week, teachers have remained all virtual and no one has been disciplined. But just imagine if instead of spending all their time and energy trying to force us back with a half-assed plan, the district spent time figuring out how to make virtual learning as good as possible, how to support teachers and families as much as possible in this process, or what if they use the time we were out of the school buildings to renovate them and fix the ventilation issue. All these ideas were put forward by our union, but ignored by the district. Many people are now citing the CDC's recent school reopening guidelines as evidence that it's safe to go back. The problem is these CDC guidelines still do not take into account the realities many urban and rural school districts face. While the general CD guide, CDC guidelines, even for the outdoors, is six foot social distancing, it says it's somehow not required for schools. When pressed about this, CDC Director Rochelle Walensky admitted it was left out because most schools don't actually have the space to do this. There also isn't much guidance on uh, teacher vaccinations. And this op-ed from the Washington Point, Post points out, um, says the guidelines do not require that teachers are offered vaccinations before they re return to the classroom. While many states have included teachers in priority groups, others have not. If the CDC included teacher vaccinations in their guidance, it could compel recalcitrant governors to move teachers to the front of the line. Simply put, after years of austerity, many school districts don't have the resources to implement a safe reopening. And let's not forget that COVID-19 is still not under control. New variants have emerged in places like Brazil and South Africa that will likely be in the United States soon, and it's unclear how much trouble it could cause. A recent article in the Atlantic uh, outlines this, saying that the mutations that help the virus spread and evade immune responses have arisen independently in multiple places. Combined with waning immunity, these factors underscore the challenge before the world. Populations may still be vulnerable to disaster scenarios just when things seem to be getting better. It's not yet known how many of the people currently affected in Manaus, Brazil, have previously recovered from COVID-19. Early data suggests that the P1 variant is now dominant in the city, but this does not mean the variant will take over everywhere. Each place and population is unique and susceptibility will vary based on which variants have already spread. Still, the virus's capacity to cause such a deadly second surge in Brazil suggests a dangerous evolutionary potential. Throughout the school reopening fight, um, a common narrative that I'm going to call the bleeding heart narrative has been used. People will say these poor kids, especially black and brown kids are falling behind. The education gap is widening. They'll never catch up. And here's my problem with this. Take Philadelphia as an example. For years and years and years, the teachers union and other activists have been sounding the alarm about the state of our schools and the need for more funding and resources. I've talked on this show before about our school buildings infested with mold, lead, asbestos, and rodents, the roofs that leak and cave in, the classrooms packed with 40 students in them, the lack of nurses that has led to students dying in school and on and on. Students in high poverty districts have been falling behind for decades because of these structural inequalities and political leaders of both parties have ignored it. And if anything, demonized teachers unions for raising these concerns. Now, all of a sudden, they are so concerned about students falling behind for one year that they wanna shove us back into a class for about two months. I don't buy it because if they felt this way, they would have brought that sense of urgency to fighting for public education over the last few decades. If you are really concerned about students falling behind, then after the pandemic, these same people pushing for re reopening need to call for massive taxes on the wealthiest individuals and corporations in every state to fund our schools. 
And again, I'm not trying to not deny that online school is far from ideal. But also, many students are, in fact, still learning during virtual school, and many teachers are doing the best they can to make it all work. I know science teachers who have used their own money to ship lab equipment to their students. If you take a tour of the virtual classes at my school or look at the work being submitted online, you'd have a hard time saying that no learning is taking place. And if you're thinking that it's ridiculous for districts to push so hard for a month or two of in-person learning, then you're right. This is about more than what it seems. This is about exerting power over the workforce and setting the stage and testing the limits for future battles with teachers unions. In a New York Times interview, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot revealed the true stakes saying about the CTU. When you have unions that have other aspirations beyond being a union and maybe being something akin to a political party, then there's always going to be conflict. I think ultimately they like to take over not only Chicago public schools, but take over running the city government. I know, God forbid, public school workers have power in the district that they work in and the city that they live in. And just like so many areas of society, the pandemic has exposed the deep inequalities in our education system. We need to safely get through this pandemic and then shift power and resources to address these inequalities, not force schools to open in order to hide them. And Ariella, um, this is just one more example that highlights how important unions are as a critical lifeline for worker health and safety. You know, without teachers unions, we'd all be forced back without question and um, it would be a disaster. And during this period, you know, I, so many times I've just thought about how thankful I am to be in a union, um, to have this kind of protection that extends, you know, it's, it's, much, it's about much more than just wages and benefits. Like your literal physical and, and you know, mental well-being is dealt with um, from the union. Yeah, and this kind of cynical line of like, oh, the teachers unions don't care about the kids. I've been seeing stories about mental health crises with kids, um, increases in suicides. That's a serious, serious issue. But it's always a serious issue, right? It's not because right. teachers unions are standing up and saying this school is not safe for what you want us to be doing. It's because schools become a hub of so many types of social services and continue to be underfunded and teachers unions continue to be under attack. So they're denied resources and it creates these endemic issues. And when the teachers union stands up for it, you know, no matter what it, no matter what they say, local government's always going to be like, no, you're wrong. If they say, give right. us more nurses, give us more social workers. We care about our kids' mental health. No, we can't do that. The, right. you know, other subjects think, will right. suffer. And again, mental health, like you said, it's been an issue for years. And guess what? Many uh, schools, the counselors are responsible for 400 caseloads. Yeah. So if you really care, you know, after this pandemic, we would, you know, be creating the funding to lower those caseloads. Um, yeah. But, you know, again, this is, I think, setting the stage for what's coming. And actually in Philadelphia, our contract expires in August, and that's going to be a fight. And I think this was about testing the limits. And I, I've been mm -hmm. encouraged about how our union's been responding. I think people, you know, sometimes the best organizer is a bad boss and it kind of has whipped people, you know, into, into organizing at their building and they might not have done before. Yeah, sometimes the best organizer is a window fan. Right, yeah. <laughs> like, that's all you get. Right. That is unbelievable to me too, unbelievable. Yeah. It's winter. Don't even, don't even get me started, yeah. Um, it's like, do you live in Philly? When that woman was describing, oh, it's part of CDC guidelines. Where's your window fan, ma'am? You're being right. interviewed. And the whole where's idea your is window fan? supposed to like blow it out. Like what it what that would do is just blow it all around the room. It's yeah, it's absurd. The these yeah. are conditions that nobody would accept if it was happening to them. Right. They simply would not accept that. They would not accept being told in their own job. I'm sure that these city officials are working remote. Mm -hmm. So. Right. Yeah, the absurdity of it is unbelievable. And I think you're absolutely right. It's it's part of the long war, you know, against teachers unions. Right.